Ladies and gentlemen, producer of radiophonic music for the BBC, Mr. Peter Howe. First of all, I want to make absolutely certain you can hear every word I say. So, let's try and do that. Now, are we in communication, all right? Yeah? You want me to speak? Speak about that, about that volume? Right, good. Yes. Now, what we're talking about is a new arrangement of the Doctor Who Sig tune. And uh, let's just get myself sorted out. Right, that's me sorted out. Now I'll get on to you. So there's no better place to start than at the beginning. Yeah. Well, that sting, which sounded a little bit muted, let's try and improve it, was the first new thing about the new Doctor Who sick team because um, previously, obviously, you'd started with the boom, ba boom, boom, ba boom. Um, well, when I spoke to John Nathan Turner about it first, which is about 18 months ago now, um, we thought, well, if you're going to have a new SIG tune, you're going to have to start it differently, otherwise everybody's just going to think, oh, it's, it's a sort of, dare I say, a doctored version of the other one. But uh, doing this, in fact, gets around that small problem that the first time you hear something new, it's got to sound really new and not like the old one mucked about a bit. So what we did was uh, go to the sting that you used to find on the end of the programme and uh, use that as a sort of basis for this opening sound. But in fact, we found that, um, uh, I don't know whether you know it, but we work on, on multi-track tape machines, 16 tracks. And, uh, come in number three. Uh, and uh, these are enormous spools of tape, very heavy. And uh, when you start it up, if in fact the sound is already on the head, um, it lurches. And rather than just start the sting clean, um, we decided to lurch it. So it's got a lurch in it, which sounds like that. Yeah. Sounds exactly the same to you, doesn't it? <laughs> in fact, it's got the start-up sound on the front. Actually, I don't know whether in fact you want it to come out of there, but it isn't. <laughs> but we'll, we'll carry on as if nothing happens. Um, originally, um, when I was originally approached to do it, the sting um, was actually going to occur after a long build-up sound, which you could really best describe as a sort of um, a background wash, which was really um, a mixture of um, the opening bass notes of the program turned upside down, and um, so that it sort of went v v v v v v v and when the last one came along, it went into a gigantic flutter and uh, went up in pitch and down in pitch, and it was slowed down. And this is what it originally sounded like before, in fact, we edited the version. So that's what it was going to sound like before we put it with the graphics and decided that uh, Really, it was too long to wait after the announcement before you got into the boom, ba boom, boom, ba boom. So we cut that out. But in fact, I didn't lose it. I kept it at one side, and a lot of you might have recognised it as being something that occurs later on. Well, when we come to the bass part, I think probably if you ask anybody what they think the Doctor Who sick tune sounds like, they're going to go boom, ba boom, boom, ba boom, or uh, you know, one or the other. <laughs> um, well, let's deal with the Boomba Booms. Uh, the Boomba Booms really have, have, uh, have got three sounds in them. And as I say, I mean, most people would just simply sing you the notes. But in fact, actually, uh, Ron Grainer's original arrangement had one particular thing about it. It had sort of lurch notes in it as well. So when I came to do the bass, I mean, I think I spent, I, overall, I spent six weeks doing the, uh, the SIG tune. And when I talk about the SIG tune, I'm really talking about the record, because uh, you probably realise that um, I did the longest piece first. So I did uh, a two and a half minute record, 
the first 30 seconds of which are the opening music of the program and the last 45 or minute and a quarter are the closing music. Uh, so consequently, what I'm talking about here really is the record because that's all I worked on. All that you're hearing at the beginning and the end of the program is a remix from the original tape. So when I came to do the bass, go back to the boom ba booms um, I decided to use uh, a CS80 Yamaha synthesizer, which some of you may know, um, which has got a very nice rich bass, which is especially good on octaves. And before, you know, we used to cut tape together, and uh, each note was cut to about three inches long, depending on the speed, and all cut together in different pitch. And made a veil where the workshop uh, exists, has got one of the longest BBC corridors ever, and uh, Dick Mills and Delia, I think, used to, to sort of lay the tape out along the corridor and count the edits and work out where everything was. Much easier for me, um, which allowed me to be more complicated, really, in a sense, because I had more time. So I used the CS80, but in order not to, um, to make it um, sound exactly like the original, I did a constant bass beat on the bottom. So you've got boom, boom, boom on the left there, and chung, 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 chung. So if you listen hard, you can hear there's a constant throb bass, which is slightly akin to what you find in, uh, in disco music. Um, and this, I think, appealed to John Nathan Turner originally when we had discussed it, um, that although obviously he didn't want disco music, he wanted something that sounded modern. So, what I'm going to play you here is what I've called bass naked, which is basically the bass notes. Then you get the thing, the, the lurch bass note. And in, in the original arrangement of, uh, of Ron Grainer's, he actually wrote in uh, things which when sung sound like uh, 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 and uh, you'd never think they are actually part of the tune, but uh, I'll show you what I mean. the normal bass. You can hear the throb underneath, but also we've got this lurch. That's all part of the music. When you put the two together, Now that's really what characterises, I think, the bass line is the fact that you've always got this feeling that you're tripping over all the time. It's got the feeling of uh, propelling you forward. Now, the other ingredient, I said there's three ingredients to the bass, and we've discussed two. The other ingredient is one of the most exciting... Um, it was already partly in the, uh, in the old situ and that's some backwards reverberation, which uh, is a strange thing to describe, and uh, probably it would be better if I had a, a blackboard and things like that. But what we do is uh, we took the bass part and um, turned the tape over, as I've discussed earlier, so we played it from the end of the tune to the beginning, and we added echo, or in technical terms, a reverberation. Echoes are sort of... And reverberation is much more like what's going on in here. So we, I'll play you that. So that's backwards. Going into reverberation. Now, what happens there is, just a second, don't go away. Ah, somebody left the Dolby on. <laughs> that explains a lot. Right, you might be able to hear now. Um, what in fact happens is that when you turn it upside down, uh, your reverberation naturally is going to occur after the note. Are you with me so far? But the note is going backwards, and so the reverberation is occurring after the note when you play it backwards, but when you turn it back around the right way, the reverberation is occurring before the note. So if you've got one note playing there, 
you can hear the next note coming because its backwards reverberation has already started. All right? <laughs> um, I said explain here. <laughs> well, that's partly it anyway. Let's see if you can see it in the total effect. This is the whole thing. I should say all three parts of the bass line. You can hear the zzz, zzz. But it's like sort of um, a constant shifting sand underneath the, the, the bass line. So you've got this firm thing on top with this shifting sound underneath. Well, one of the questions is actually somebody asked me when we were um, signing autographs, and we were um, signing autographs, and I must admit, actually, on that subject, I was completely overwhelmed at your enthusiasm. And uh, thank you very much for a lot of your questions about this. I hope I'm going to answer a few of them now. Um, what somebody called a bird tweeting sound. Uh, is this in the, uh, the sick tune? I originally thought of as a Catherine wheel, but uh, it doesn't really matter. I don't really mind what people think, as long as they like the sound. What I wanted to do was I wanted the theme to actually burst out of the eye of a Catherine wheel, in my mind. That's what I wanted to have. And so I thought, well, the best way of starting that, bearing in mind, I mean, as you saw the other night on the old Royal Fireworks, um, the basic thing is fire, so a match strike, one match strike. Now you, you take this match strike, at least I did, and I um, chopped the front of it uh, so that it's not got that very nasty aggressive sound right on the front. All you're hearing is the flare sound, which happens directly afterwards. And uh, then in fact copied it off and made a loop of these flares, just going shh, 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 all the way around, which is basically what's happening in a Catherine wheel. Um, then, in fact, uh, slowed it down. This is the, that's the loop. All right, and then we're going to slow it down so it's much bigger, much bigger flame. All right. Now, that's at half speed, obviously with a lot of gaps in it, and it isn't quite the sound that you, I hope you realise I'm talking about, right at the front, just before the, the, the theme comes out. What in fact then I did was put it through um, a phase unit, so that the uh, top frequencies of the flare, which is quite a phasey sound anyway, are really aggressively phased. So it's <laughs> So consequently, what you're getting is this feeling of going round in a circle that you get, uh, I don't know, when uh, aeroplanes are approaching, you get this sort of funny drain pipey sound. Well, so basically that was in order to try and get the, um, the Catherine wheel actually to turn. And as you all probably realise what it sounds like, this is actually it off the, uh, the multi-track machine. Obviously, I didn't explain the whole process. Part of the bit I missed out was the fact that having got it all sorted out, I couldn't get it to, um, to be dynamic enough for the, for the notes to come out of it, so I spooled it by hand. Um, and you know, if you spool just the tape machine, the, head, the tape dragging past the head, and just spool it by hand, and you can get all sorts of dynamic into it, because in fact you're performing it. Uh, whereas if you, in fact you just hit the fast wind, I mean, it does what, whatever it likes. So there's a lot of hand spooling in there as well. Well, when it comes to the, um, the other thing that people think, well, that's the Doctor Who sick tune. As I said, it's the ooey oo. And I, um, I really did think it would be an awful pity to actually get rid of that sound. 
because it really is the doctor's trademark. And I think a lot of you have kindly noticed that we've started using it as a trademark in the incidental music as well. And uh, that was quite done on purpose because I think in fact it gives the whole thing a better continuity. But we didn't get rid of it. I decided to, to do the same sound. The difficulty was, I mean, in the old days, they, they used oscillators, uh, some boxes about this size, and uh, the OEU would have probably been done by hand. Um, nowadays, a lot of keyboards about, and in fact, we've got something like um, ooh, eight different synthesizers in the workshop. Uh, and believe it or not, none of the modern ones just could make anything like that noise. Um, in the end, I, I used an old ARP Odyssey um, that we'd already ceased to use. The new one didn't seem to do it either. Uh, we've got a new one. So it's an old ARP Odyssey and it's double tracked. Because, I mean, one thing they were unable to do in the old days was track things so that when you, when you got the second phrase, uh, it goes, well, well, the, second, the first phrase is still there on this version, whilst the second one is moving around underneath. See what I mean? So consequently, with that phrase and with all sorts of other phrases in it, I was able to um, struck, layer it more than the original, which makes it a thicker texture. Now, this is definitely the hardest part, uh, because the... Well, I'll play it, this bit. An awful lot of you might have noticed, I don't know, some people don't, that in fact it's based on the vocoder. It is actually voice synthesis, that. Um, and it was done in a rather strange way and in order to give myself a chance to um, to have a drink of water I'll let myself do the talking uh, well, This is the part of the talk where I have a rest and let the patient work uh, what we're describing here is the, the coda which is not you might know already so, this is that uh, sounds as if I've got a peg on my nose but it it's a very buzzing sound off the synthesizer. And uh, if in fact we just feed that through and I hum or go ooh ah ooh ah into the box at the same time and we um, play it across so you can hear how things fit together. You'll see how I do this particular bit. Right, here we go then. Here's the synthesizer then. And gradually we're going to take that away and my voice is going to mix with it and try to do the program. See, I couldn't have explained that. <laughs> I tried it. Um, yeah, well, I hope you got that. Basically, you, you can play a synthesizer note, but you only hear it when you speak into a microphone. And the filtering, the treble and the bass sound on the note, is totally affected by your vowel sound. So, in fact, if you wanted a very trebly sound, you'd be going e, and a very bass one, ooh. Uh, it makes you into an absolute idiot doing this sort of thing and <laughs> you need to lock the door before you try it. <laughs> but basically, if you actually, I have to admit, I've erased the track that did originally have my voice on, but it, it was something like... <laughs> um, so it's just as well we don't actually get paid to sing. <laughs> Anyway, that's actually how that was done, and uh, although it sounds more complicated than that, uh, the complication is merely a case of uh, a little bit more um, hissy noise and a little bit more layering, as I described earlier. Anyway, this is the phrasing question again. Right, your time is up. Um, now, I think 
And the best thing to do to explain really or to show you how all these pieces fit together uh, in order for you to see how all these little tiny bits I've been talking about really fit together, I'll play you the first 30 seconds of the total thing and hopefully you're going to be able to see things in it that you hadn't heard before. One thing that we haven't talked about is the tinkly bit <laughs> that happens at the end. Uh, it, in the original Doctor Who uh, title music, the end credits didn't have a tinkly bit in. It didn't have the bit that... Um, I can't remember it now. <laughs> um, the middle eight of Ron Grainer's music n was never used in the, uh, in the titles, and I thought it was a great pity and really ought to have been. Right, that's a bit. Well, I thought it'd be rather nice, in fact, to... Um, what I wanted to do was play it on a glockenspiel, hit with a hammer. <laughs> uh, <coughs> it didn't work. It was awful. I mean, it was so bad that I raised that as well. <laughs> I can't even play that. But it was, it was strung together, all, or, you know, spliced together on tape. Um, but I think you'll probably be able to see how my mind worked after that in the sound that I originally, eventually did use, and that uh, is uh, an octaved um, tremolo on a Jupiter, a Roland Jupiter synthesizer. Uh, you play two notes, an octave apart, and you can actually get them to swap like that very, very fast. Play three octaves, it'll jump up and down the octaves very, very fast, and it gives you this, um, what some people have called uh, a sort of glassy um, effect. And uh, after that, actually, it'll go into the, um, the bit in the record that doesn't actually occur in the uh, credits at all. But in fact, it was, it was the only bit written by Howell, actually, in, in the record. <laughs> This is the trombone stop, actually. Well, um, as I said earlier, that thing that I didn't use right at the front actually happens again. The Catherine wheel returns at the end of the end music and I just picked this thing off the floor <laughs> uh, that I discarded at the beginning and turned it back to front and it's, it sounds like this So that bit wasn't wasted in the end. Uh, you know, I never like to waste sounds like that. I was quite pleased with it. Um, and it came in very useful because originally when we delivered the, uh, the final end credit music, the graphics um, used to end in blank space. There was no sign of an explosion or anything. And uh, it was decided that because the, uh, the presentation announcer used to ruin the end of Doctor Who programs by uh, talking about the next week's sports news or something over the last sound, that the best thing to do was to blow him up. <laughs> <laughs> So the graphics uh, bloke thought this was a very good idea because although in fact all his books, his textbooks tell him never go to a whiteout because it shows up all the dirt. 
we went to a whiteout and uh, it uh, did work very well um, because in fact the uh, presentation announcer doesn't dare get anywhere near it now he just wouldn't survive anyway how long have I got Mark how am I doing all right um, it's just that if I was to go on I would be talking about incidental music and I think it's probably a good idea I was going to play you the the total sick but I think probably that's a bad idea let's nip on a bit just have to talk amongst myself for a few seconds. Always come prepared, that's right. Right, let's talk about incidental music. Um, one of the major pitfalls of incidental music, I think, is that um, if it's marvellous and fantastic and wonderful, nobody ever sees the pictures or hears the plot or anything else. If it's deadly dull, nobody remembers it and says, I didn't know there was any incidental music to Doctor Who. Um, and so you've got to get somewhere in between the two and you've actually got to allow enough space for people to hear the dialogue, obviously. Uh, and also, in fact, um, improve the emotional content of it uh, to such a degree that it's even exciting. Now, I've got um, a sequence from Megloss, which actually I enjoyed greatly. Um, and despite what it said in one of your handouts, uh, I was ill for the first episode. I was actually going to do all of them, and Paddy stepped in at the very last moment and did the music for episode one. Uh, and so it's more a case really of me being down to do all of them but uh, him saving the day on episode one. Anyway, uh, episode three featured a scene with a character who always, I always think is called Gladys but uh, it was something like that, Caris I think. And the doctor, or what looked like the doctor, uh, was basically, a, sort of, he was abducting her in the cavern. It was like this. <laughs> That's how it gets to us, you see, and you could put all sorts of <laughs> meanings for that. <laughs> um, and really, in fact, you know, you could lose your job overnight if you did the wrong sort of music to that. So, um, you can see how difficult it is. What really needs to be done there is you've got several things to be done. You've got to get music that, in fact, allows you to hear those whispered remarks, which, um, although it's very dramatic, from an acting point of view, can be absolutely the devil's own job to get around when you're actually writing music because, I mean, television sound doesn't operate over a gigantic dynamic range and really you find yourself in the end writing notes in between the words. So in order to do it accurately, you've got to have the soundtrack on the multi-track tape. So I put that soundtrack onto the tape down the bottom, track 16. And uh, on track 15... I put um, something which has sort of become known as audio time code. Um, this is a very, very uh, difficult um, thing to recruit for. I was hoping to get somebody like Robert Powell or Richard Burton to do this talking job, but uh, there wasn't any money available, so I did it. Actually, see, it's seconds. Um, and uh, you match those up to the time code numbers on the program as sent to you from Television Centre. Uh, and I don't know, obviously a lot of you have seen them. There's a time code there with three sets of numbers and one of them and what you then need to do is, is put a little blip sound on track 13 every time the shot changes. So you coincide it with one of those numbers say on 45 seconds into the shot it changes to a close-up of the doctor when he says, I am Megloss. You, you put a little blip on it, and that tells you exactly where your music has got to happen strongly. So you end up with 
something like this. There is another. That's the shot change. Why do you think you are the city doctor? Well, precisely because I am not the doctor. Close up. I am not. Do you Then he's got this matchbox toy in his hand. And he opens his hand. Right. <laughs> Shock change. It is not the anger that means. Although we have cause for anger, we will act in justice. So you can see, it's gradually building up, <laughs> got the blips on, no music, um, but you can't play music in a void, you've got to actually play it to some sort of beat. So over the top of all that, on track 12, you put a metronome beat, and you've still got the blips, and you've still got the soundtrack. So you're then in position of actually writing out some bar lines, four beats to the bar, and you can draw in all the shot changes. So you're then in a position to actually start writing the music. Well, if you imagine that you've got a whole episode um, come to you on day one, on day nine or ten, you're in the cipher dubbing suite putting it all together, and uh, the producer has asked for um, something like 12 minutes of music. You've got to go through 12 minutes of the program and do all that work on it before you can write a single note. Having done that, however, you're in a very, very good position to actually get on with it quite fast. And uh, I'll just play you the finished result of this. Well, as you can see, um, that on every single cue can take you quite a time, but there are times when we have to do actually two minutes of finished music per day, right from scratch to the finished article, um, every day for nine days in order to finish the incidental music for the dub. So in fact, you can see that um, a lot of work goes into the program. In fact, I know you know a lot of work goes into the program, and I'm glad that you appreciate it. But very often, people don't actually hear the incidental music at all, and uh, sometimes it's a bit galling. <laughs> people say, I didn't know it had any incidental music. Anyway, there was just one thing I wanted to do other than that, and that was play you the very thing that uh, we didn't talk about, and I've no doubt you want to ask questions about, and that's this. The end of the sick tune. Thank you very much. <laughs>